So today is Vision Day, Vision Sunday, and we do this twice a year. And the reason we do it twice a year is because vision leaks, and um, we want to just make sure that every single person in the church is clear about what God has called us to do and to be. And I'm going to use this passage in the Bible to, um, to be like a launch pad. Um, it was great to be singing about um, God's vision. We need God's vision. We need him to be um, if you like, revealing that to us from heaven. And so it's something not just that I'm going to talk about, but it's something that somehow we need to be um, praying into and receiving as we are um, thinking and hearing this today. So as, as I'm speaking, please would you be praying, just saying, Lord, show us, show me what's my part in, what, in this church, what you're calling me to do, and what you're calling this church to do and, um, and as it plays its part in um, Tower Hamlets and East London. Um, our vision in a nutshell, is to see Shadwell and East London transformed by the love and power of Jesus. And God's called us to do that by making disciples, by transforming communities, and planting churches. And I just want to tell you a little bit of our story. So um, we've just last weekend celebrated our ninth birthday as a church. And the ninth birthday was that... um, the church was actually built in 1656, so we're 358 years old as a church. Um, but um, around 2004, the church had got about 10 to 15 members left, um, just for various demographic reasons. They hadn't caught up with things. And so um, the church was beginning to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and it was going to be closed. And the Bishop of London just thought, let's just take, let's try one last thing. And he went to Holy Trinity Brompton, um, uh, the large church in West London and said, would you like to plant um, a new congregation into this church? And I um, in 2005, around this time, um, Louis and me and our family and um, 100 people came from that church. 80 of them already lived in East London and 20 people moved house uh, from various parts of West London and South West London to come to Shadwell in East London to come and be part of this new, exciting adventure. That was nine years ago. That's what we were celebrating last weekend. And God has been doing amazing things with us since then. So the church has grown. We've had a throughput of about 800, 900 people, something like that. Um, We're in an area of high transition. Um, So people will come for two or three or four years, um, stay for a while. And we've seen that not as people leaving, but actually as a chance to invest in people for a short amount of time while they're here. And then to send them onto um, other places. But God has also enabled us to plant churches. So we've been able to see St. Peter's Bethnal Green with Adam and Heather Atkinson leading that in 2010, along with All Hallows Bow in the other part of um, the uh, borough uh, with Chris and Becky Rogers, sent from here to plant those churches. They were going to be, one of them was going to be closed, one of them they were really not sure what to do. And with the injection of people and money and resources and vision, those churches are now not just um, well on their feet to recovery, they are thriving as churches. And they are probably in a better state than they've ever been in living memory, which is amazing because you have sent those people out. Um, Just earlier last year, um, uh, Ed and Fuzz Dix took a team from here to go to Millwall on the Isle of Dogs um, to do our third plant. And they are doing really well. It's a really tough area, a tough challenge. They don't have a church building to meet in. So they're meeting at the moment in a school and temporary accommodation. And God is growing that church as well. The extraordinary thing is that rather than diminishing in size when we've planted churches and sent people in teams to go to these churches, God has actually grown us as a church through planting. As we've given away, God has given us more. I always love that. That's kind of God's mathematics, isn't it? The more you give the more he gives. And he looks after the balance of those things. You find exactly the same thing with financial giving. We've got the privilege of doing our fourth plant later this year. Darren Wolf is going to be taking a team from here to go and plant a a new congregation at Christchurch Spitalfields, about a mile and a half that way. We're going to partner with Holy Trinity Brompton again to do a joint plant. So they're going to send a team as well. We're sending a team to start something new. And the idea behind that is to supercharge that evening service to start planting, to start growing, but also to start planting churches all over this borough as well and, and beyond. It's a church that 
that is much, much, it's about four times, five times the size of this, and it needs a big congregation. So we play our part in sending a few of us to go and do something new there, which will hopefully grow and be a great blessing to Tower Hamlets and beyond. So it's all very exciting. That's what we do. Those are the kind of things we, um, we want to be a part of. We want to see God's kingdom come here on earth as in heaven. That's what we've just been praying. So why, why are we doing this? Why are we doing stuff that's expensive, exhausting, emotionally challenging? Um, actually, spiritually, there's a lot of um, spiritual warfare and attack around the whole thing as well. Why do we do it? Well, we believe that it's all about Jesus and all about what he wants to do with us, with the people around us, with the people in this borough, this people in East London. And here in Matthew 9, I love this passage, we see Jesus' vision realized. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, verse 35, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. He proclaimed the kingdom of God is near. He was saying, come and see it. Come and hear about it. Come and experience it. Come and be transformed by the kingdom of God. He said, repent. That means turn your life around and hear the good news. So like the 12 disciples who by this stage have um, seen these things, they've heard them, they've received them, they're beginning to believe it. They're beginning to realize, yes, we want to follow um, Jesus. He calls us as well to model our lives on him and to catch Jesus' vision for ourselves and just begin to start saying, how can we work out this vision in our own lives in this place for now, 2014? So here is just, let's look at these verses in detail and see what they have to say to us. So the first thing we see, and I'm going to just, as I like doing, I'm going to draw up on here um, so you can remember what I'm trying to say. The first thing is that the need is urgent. There is an urgency about what we are about. Here is a clock. And it's five to midnight and something is going to happen around midnight. There's an urgency. There is an urgency. Jesus, yeah, sorry, you can't see over there. Can you see that? Thanks, thank you very much. So there's an urgency. Jesus saw that they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Do you like this picture? That sheep is in big trouble. <laughs> Just about to be mown down by a lorry. There is an urgent need in our church and around us to make disciples. You know, in Tower Hamlets, when you add up all the numbers of people in churches, there are less than 3% of the population attend church on a Sunday in Tower Hamlets. Millions of people around East London are spiritually lost. They don't know Jesus. We want here to invite everyone we can to come to the Alpha Course. The Alpha Course is an opportunity to hear about the meaning of life. It's an opportunity to discover who Jesus is and what he did for each one of us. A chance to encounter Jesus personally, to receive him, to be changed by him. We want everyone to um, encounter, um, to have a, have a chance to go on Alpha. That means us being on it, but actually inviting our friends, our neighbors, our families, and so on. We also want everyone to be involved in connect groups. Once you've done Alpha, that's the next step, to be in a connect group. That's where we begin to start making disciples. It's a chance not just to do something for an hour on a Sunday, hour and a half on a Sunday, but actually to put it into practice um, with more detail, with more uh, more accountability. And we recognize that for some it's hard to come to some of the connect groups. We want to make it possible for everyone to be in a connect group. So we want to to form new connect groups to to help those who can't fit into the existing ones. So let us know. We want to try and make that possible so that you can help be a part of this um, whole area of making disciples. So key for us, not just to be a disciple, but to help others to be disciples too. We're called to make disciples. There's an urgent need to do that. 
There's an urgent need to see our communities transformed. You know, we live in an area of the highest poverty in the country. Just across the road over there, is, it was 1%, it's now, um, sorry, number one, it's now number two highest child poverty in the country, just on the estate over there. On our watch, while, here, while we're here in Shadwell, God is calling us, not just to rec- look at that as a statistic, but actually to play our part in seeing that statistic change because God is passionate and compassionate about the poor. And he wants us to catch that for ourselves. And that's just one of the things. There's um, higher than average health issues in this area. There's high unemployment. There's high youth issues. There's um, uh, loneliness issues for the aged and, um, and, and people in general. So what does transformation look like? Transformation looks like people meeting Jesus and giving their lives to him. It looks like marriages helped and restored. It looks like um, parents who are just trying to work out how to parent their children being equipped and helped to do that. It looks like um, the lonely being welcomed and helped the isolated, being kind of coming, people coming alongside them to express and share love with them. It looks like the broken being restored and healed. It looks like the sick being prayed for and cared for. There are just so many ways that the homeless receiving long-term sheltered accommodation. What are the things, what are the issues that you see all around you? These are the issues that God wants us to begin to say, Lord, your love compels me to see this situation, this life transformed. God has called us to be part of transforming um, the communities with an urgency. There's an urgent need to do that. And there's an urgent need to plant churches. Planting churches, the reason we are into planting churches is because it is the most successful way of growing the church known on the planet. All the research says that is the way to most effectively grow the church is by planting churches. Some people say, well, it ran Tower Hamlet, see, there's no need for churches anymore. Only 3% of people go to church. Well, that's the point. Only 3% go to church. We need more churches to reach those localities, reaching different groups of people, reaching um, different areas and people groups and so on. There's an urgency to plant churches. That's why we're planting again into Spitalfields. We're going to keep on planting. I've got conversations going with um, groups in Bermondsey and um, Eltham. And you know, people want, to, uh, want churches to come and help them to receive new people, to supercharge them into a new ministry, a new way of reaching out to their communities. But church planting is costly. So um, for us... As a church, we have spent £147,000 over the last three and a half years getting All Hallows Bow going. That's a huge amount of giving from you to enable another church, not ours, to get started and to thrive. That is something which, when you start telling people around, they cannot believe that, that a church would help another church to get started and, and grow by spending that much money. That's how much it costs for salaries and for operations costs and um, to, to, to do their own community work. That's a fantastic thing. We gave 20,000 to St. Peter's Bethnal Green. They were in a different financial um, state that had more people who were able to give, but we were able to give them that amount of money. These are huge sums. Church planting costs money. It costs people because we're giving these people away. So it's emotionally difficult when we say goodbye to people But it's worth it because the kingdom of God is growing. We're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep giving away our money, I'm afraid. We're going to keep on giving away people. We're going to keep on getting, experiencing pain of loss. But we will experience great joy as we see those other places and communities touched and transformed because of what you're doing. It's an amazing, amazing thing. The need is urgent. Secondly, we see Jesus saying that the motive is love. Look at verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them. 
So um, the motive then is love. I'm just going to put motive here. It's a broken heart. And Jesus is interested in mending broken hearts. The strongest word for love is this word behind this word, compassion, in the, in, in the original language. It's, it's a, a, a word that's used for your guts. You feel it in your guts. You know when you are so moved that you just feel pain here? This is the, the, the word that is, is just trying to describe compassion. It's like saying Jesus was gutted when he saw the crowds. He had deep compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. That love is um, not just for particular groups of people. Just turn back. You see two stories just nestled in each other from verse 18. You see the heading, Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. So you've got two people here. You've got a, um, a synagogue leader, a ruler in verse 18, someone who was probably quite wealthy, well-established in the community, a, a kind of well, um, high-ranking official. But then you've got this woman in verse 20 who has been bleeding for 12 years. She's got a menstrual issue where she can't stop this bleeding. In that society, that meant you were cast out. You were pushed to the edges, the fringes of the, that society. You were rejected. And Jesus has compassion on both of them. He responds to the ruler to help his daughter who's dying and to this lady who is on the fringes of society who's been rejected. It doesn't matter who you are. Jesus is interested in you. It doesn't matter as as we look around the different groups of people, the wealthy um, riverside um, dwellers through to the... um, the Bangladeshi Muslims, the um, professional people who are around, the old EastEnders, different groups of people. Jesus is interested in them all. He has called us to reach these different groups of people in different ways. And there are people in this church who feel a particular passion for um, particular groups of people. We want to say, go for it. Stoke that fire. That's a compassion from Jesus. Holding it together is challenging sometimes, but that's what we're committed to doing. That motive for connecting with these people is love. And that love comes from God. Have you encountered personally the love of God? That love will transform us. It's when we find our identity in him and we hear those words in in our being. You are my child. God's saying to you, you're my child. I love you. I've given my life for you. I want the best for you. I want to come alongside you and help you and nurture you and, and be the best that I can for you. God wants every single one of us to have that identity where we're completely confident that God is for us, not against us. That the God, even when everything is raging around us and we, it might feel like God is far away, actually we have that inner sense, that knowledge, because we've encountered that love, that he is close by. In the midst of the storm, he's an anchor. All of us are broken in different ways. All of us um, experience some measure of rejection or pain or difficulty. And it's in that place that God wants to pour out his love into your heart. You can be confident superficially about who you are and you can come across as very confident, but deep down inside, actually, there's, an un, uh, there's um, a lack of confidence because we don't have our identity in God. We need to receive God's love. It's not something which is like, oh, it's love. <laughs> actually, it's so powerful enough to send Jesus to his death. He died because he loves you. We need to receive that. That's why ministry of the Spirit is so important. That's why we pray for people at the end of our services. That's why we want to say, God, it's nothing we can do. It's what you do. That's why we say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Those words of Paul, that encouragement to turn to God for everything. That's why our worship is so important. We want to give ourselves to God, recognizing that he is the one who is going to enable us to live our lives to the full, not doing it in our own strength. 
Our motive is love. The third thing we see here is prayer. That prayer is like a trigger. And um, it's, it's like, I'm going to write a call here. Because um, Jesus, oh, well, I'll say it in a minute. These people are saluting. And there's... Jesus says this. He said to his disciples, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Verse 37. Sorry, verse 38. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We need to pray. We need to pray that God will um, raise up more people to follow Jesus, to reap the harvest that is around us. We need to pray that God will raise us up to take a step and say, I'm in. I'm going to sign up. I want to serve you as much as I can in, in, in your church and in your world. And it's very easy just to be a spectator in church. It's very easy to, to let the good music and the, you know, um, listening to the others do good teaching and um, great prayer and nice coffee and stuff. It's easy to be a spectator. But actually, we want to help you to move on from being a spectator. To actually playing a part, the part that God has for you in this church. Imagine a football game. Football games are, you know, characterized, aren't they, by 22,000 people desperately in need of exercise watching a game uh, of 22 people desperately in need of a rest. That's, you know, a football game. But, you know, the spectators, there are spectators just watching the game. But that's nothing like the experience of playing it. Spectator, player. But then players, there are some players who are so... Great, because they've worked at their game, they're skillful, that they become playmakers. They're the ones who set up the goals. They're the ones who score the goals. They're the ones who are amazing defenders and um, able to stop goals. They're the ones who um, uh, kind of get the ball down the wing and pass it over and um, enable um, more goals to be scored. Playmakers. People who are fantastic at what they do because they've worked at it, they've thought about their game, they've developed, they've trained themselves so that they are at the peak of their performance. Spectators, players, playmakers, and there are coaches. There are people who are great at helping others to multiply their gifts, to actually see these players um, trained, getting better and better, and, and um, getting more and more people involved in the game. Where are you? Spectator, player, playmaker, coach. God calls us, all of us, to be coaches. But we need to take it step by step. Now, I don't know much about football. I'm a rugby player myself. I was a bit sad, gutted. If you saw the England game yesterday, oh, it lasts two minutes. But enough of that. Um, <laughs> so, Alex Ferguson, this chap here. Up until he was 16, he loved watching Rangers in Scotland. Age 16, he got the chance to play for them. He soon became one of their top goal scorers. In time, he um, then started to, he moved around a few clubs, always getting loads of goals for those clubs. Then he had the chance to be a manager, and he ended up um, managing Aberdeen Football Club. It was kind of not doing so well. When he took it over, they, he, that team became the first team to win the Scottish Cup instead of the normal um, Rangers and, um, and uh, Celtic. Thank you. So... I was going to say Celtic, and I thought, no, no, I'm going down the wrong track there. So Aberdeen won the cup under his management. Then um, he kind of, uh, they went to, in his, under his management, they went on to win the European Cup. Extraordinary feat for a, a, a Scottish team. He then ended up as what we, he is most well known for, which is the, being the manager of Manchester United. Under his um, leadership, they won 38 trophies. They won the European Cup twice. He won something like 900, almost 940 games were won under his management. He was knighted for his services to football. 
He's probably, well, he is known as um, the most successful, admired, and respected manager in the history of the game. He was passionate right from the beginning, from spectating to playing to being a goal scorer, a playmaker, to being a coach and a manager. Passionate um, about making a difference with the team that he was playing for, enabling them to succeed. I love these two quotes. I've never played for a draw in my life. And he said this, as long as there are games to play, it's not over. Do you know, we need that kind of passion in the church. We need that passion to play in church. To move from being a spectator, who can be very passionate, but they're actually not doing anything, to playing the game, learning um, how our, you know, what our role is, how we play our part. Then beginning to actually set up for other people to succeed. And then getting to that place where we begin to start multiplying effectiveness, beginning to start leading and helping others to take a place in the team. We need to pray that people will step off the terraces and get involved in the game. Not just inside the church, but outside. Every single person is a potential player. Prayer is the trigger, because Jesus said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. It's not something we do in our own strength. We say, Lord, here I am. Send them. No, it sends me. Send me. It might start with send them, send someone. And then often the Lord will go, how about you? What is your part? And there's a call to sign up and go for it. Finally, we see that the potential is vast. I've stolen that phrase from Nicky Gumbel, who I heard a talk that he gave where um, he was talking about fishing and the, Jesus speaking to the fishermen. They'd work all night fishing. They were fishermen. They knew what they were doing. They hadn't caught anything. And Jesus, a carpenter from the shore, says, fish on the other side. And they threw the net on the other side and caught this massive load that just started breaking the nets. Jesus knows where to catch fish. And the potential is vast. The potential, there are so many fish around and often we're just fishing in the wrong place. Jesus said here, a different analogy, the harvest is plentiful. Verse 37, the harvest is plentiful. Jesus led by proclaiming the kingdom and healing the sick, talking about it and doing it. He now calls every single one of us to get stuck in as well, to follow his model, to share his mission, to multiply the mission's reach. And here at St. Paul's, we need every single person to be involved. It is amazing. I just, you know, just, it's amazing what God is doing with us. So just, these are recent things. So um, uh, Nathan and Nita are called to be missionaries of this church. They haven't gone to Bangladesh. They've gone 200 yards away to the Martineau estate to give their lives full time to helping reach people with the gospel. Chris Day, a doctor here, is leading a team who wants to set up a healing room. He's not content with being just a medical doctor. He wants to see supernatural healing right through as a spectrum from um, practical medicine through to supernatural medicine. A healing room here to open to anyone who wants to be prayed for to be healed, not just in this, inside the church but outside. Um, there's a team of people who are exploring how to help um, those who have experienced the trauma of, um, of having an abortion. And um, this team is, is being trained right now to say, actually, how can we extend the love of God and, and healing to people? It's something like a quarter of people in this country have experienced uh, an abortion. And yet it's so untalked about and the trauma is associated with that. It's a fantastic thing. These, these things are going on just with people saying, I want to do this. I want to um, play this part in the life of this church. Over, I, I reckon it's something like over 150 people are actively involved in serving in some way. That's an amazing thing. An amazing thing. And there are eight people at the moment who <coughs> excuse me, are exploring ordination different stages of that. It's fantastic, leading future churches um, to do this kind of thing again and again. 
So we want every person to be involved in some way, to play their part, um, so that this church can thrive and fulfill its missional potential, the potential that God has for us, because the potential is for us. I didn't draw a picture, did I? Um, What was I going to draw? I'll remember that in a minute. Um, I'll draw the picture in a minute. So... Just think, the potential is vast. 3% of people go to church in Tower Hamlets. Less than 3%, actually. So that means 97% of people don't. That's the potential. 97% of people don't go to church in Tower Hamlets. It's a huge opportunity. What part will you play? So we want to um, encourage you to throw yourself into St. Paul's in some way. 